One of the big focuses of my work has been what's happening to someone when they're stressed, when they're afraid, when they're terrified. And that can be when someone is just suddenly realizing that they're being betrayed by a boss they thought cared about them and was nurturing their career, and now suddenly they're treating them as an object. So evolution shaped our brains to have certain responses to danger, to have responses to being attacked, whether it's by a predator that wants to eat us or whether it's by a sexual predator who wants to do things to our body that we don't want done. And one of the ways that we can understand this is that we have a circuitry of our brain. Uh, we call it the defense circuitry in neuroscience. And it's a circuitry that's always scanning for danger. And when it detects danger or attack, it shifts how the rest of the brain is working. And one of the things it can do really quickly is shift how people's attention is working. And so their attention becomes grabbed by parts of the experience that seem really crucial to coping and surviving or, or not jeopardizing that relationship or the danger to your career and those sorts of things. But it's very, you know, what we call bottom-up attention. It's attention that's captured by things in the experience that are threatening. And one of the other things this defense circuitry does is it can very rapidly impair that reasoning part of our brain, this prefrontal cortex, this part that allows us to be rational and think things through and make good, sophisticated, flexible decisions. And when stress kicks in and when fear kicks in, within a couple of seconds, that part of our brain can become significantly impaired, sometimes basically taken offline. And when that happens, what do we fall back on? We tend to fall back on habits and reflexes and very simple decision-making processes that are not rational things we're thinking out a lot. And we fall back on habits um, like how to deal with aggressive and dominant people that we've had to deal with in our lives. We may fall back on habits from uh, being abused in the home as a child or prior experiences of sexual abuse. We may fall back on habits of how, especially girls and women are socialized to deal with unwanted sexual advances that are coming at them so much and how to politely say no without saying no. And, and when the, this defense circuitry takes over, it can make them very vulnerable to, to being manipulated, to being coerced, to being assaulted. Um, and on the surface, it can look like, you know, they might awkwardly smile, they might be engaging in behaviors that on the surface look like it's not such a big deal, but underneath they could be really freaking out. And when things get really extreme, when people are being restrained, when they're being held down and assaulted, when they're really terrified, then they can fall back on really extreme, what I call survival reflexes, where people can actually become paralyzed and unable to move. Sometimes when people are terrified, suddenly their blood pressure and heart rate drop and they become dizzy. They may even pass out from fear. There doesn't need to be alcohol involved for people to pass out in certain assaults. And their body may go limp. And then the perpetrator, they're like a rag doll. The perpetrator just does whatever they want to them. And so these are responses that evolution put into our brains to survive attack by predators. And it may seem strange to talk about that when we're talking about someone preying on someone in harassment or grabbing someone's butt. Um, but these are the effects that we can see. So for example, Taylor Swift, you know, in her deposition in this case that she recently won, uh, you know, some people would say, oh, well, all he did was grab her butt. But she describes how when he grabbed her butt, she went into shock. She couldn't think straight. She could barely get out the words at this meet and greet she was at. She said it was like my personality was erased. And so these effects can be very, very powerful and dramatic of just someone just grabbing you in a certain way or doing something to you that is a betrayal, that is a, treating you like an object. And then finally, in terms of memory, there's these general principles of memory. You know, we're not going to remember everything that happens here. We remember things that we focus attention on. We remember things that are emotionally significant to us. And this gets dramatically amplified when that defense circuitry takes over, when we're under attack. And so certain parts of the experience can get really burned in and other parts that the person's not noticing or don't seem significant to them at the time, they're not getting encoded into their brain. And this we call differential encoding of what really got attention, what was really scary and awful versus the things that didn't get much attention and weren't that significant. This can account for people having memories afterwards that, seem very fra that are very fragmentary. There's lots of pieces missing. Um, and then another thing that can happen is at a certain stage, the brain can have trouble encoding the sequence of things. So you may be taking in that awful sensation of being grabbed or squeezed or penetrated or the smell of whiskey on the person's breath or something like that, 
But at a certain point, you may not be taking in what sequence that happens. And so like in the case study, to ask someone to narrate something even forward, let alone in reverse, is going to set them up for inconsistencies in their memory or questioning someone about things that were peripheral details that they didn't even notice, you're going to create inconsistencies. And as an expert who works on these cases, I see over and over again the inconsistencies in people's memories are caused by the investigators asking the wrong questions, pushing for information that is not available. And so finally, another thing that really affects memory, it, it, the way stress can affect memory, is when people are trying to retrieve memories, when they're trying to recall, whether telling their friend or telling an investigator, stress impairs retrieval. And so if you're interviewing with a police officer who isn't believing you, who is doubting you, who doesn't understand these principles of memories, who's asking you to do it in reverse, that's pretty stressful. It's stressful enough to talk to a police officer about these horrible experiences. And then people actually can't remember things that are encoded in their brain. And so these are things that we see in terms of how memory can be affected by stress and trauma that are still terribly misunderstood throughout our culture, even among professionals dealing with this.